Hey everybody, this is Alex Fabrica coming at you again with another Teaching Tips Tuesday. We are continuing our series on the impacts a visual impairment has on child development. And today we have with us Mimi, Mimi Pruniski. I said it wrong, didn't I? It's close enough, Pruniski. <laughs> Prun okay, we're just gonna start over. I'm sorry, Chloe, start the recording here. Okay, Okay. Pruniski, not Pruniski, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Alex Fabia coming at you again with another Teaching Tips Tuesday. We are continuing our series on the impacts a visual impairment has on child de development. We have so far had a physical therapist, a speech language pathologist, so I figure it is time for occupational therapy. We have with us Mimi Pruniski. She is an incredible OT here at the Foundation for Blind Children. How are you doing today, Mimi? Great. I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on with us. And since you are our OT, I figured we could talk about the sensory implications of a visual impairment and the fine motor implications. Sounds awesome. Makes Looking sense. forward. To All right. Let's start with sensory. Great. Well, I have um, I have a couple things that I'd like to share with you guys today. Um, first of all, I I always start with talking about the sensory pyramid and the learning pyramid. And the reason that I do this is I like to put things in perspective so that we have sort of an understanding about why I think sensory is so important with looking at academics and the implications of that for our for our kiddos with a vision impairment. So I'm going to show you a, a quick a quick visual. So this is the learning pyramid. And just briefly at the top of it is academic learning. And what I just want to show you is at the base of the pyramid is all the sensory and tactile, vestibular, visual, auditory, uh, proprioceptive, and gustatory. And we as OTs are looking at a lot of the, the foundational skills. When we look at that, with our kiddos here, vision is one of those foundational skills. And so, the, the kiddos that we're talking about here automatically have kind of a crumbling foundation because vision is affected. Then we're looking at proprioceptive, vestibular, and tactile. Just to briefly talk about all of those. Tactile has to do with our sense of touch. Vestibular is movement, our sense of movement and space. And proprioceptive is our joint sense and kind of our body schema. And all of those things tend to be affected with our children that have some kind of a vision impairment, whether that be a very mild um, vision loss or a significant vision loss or a child who's totally blind. So with regards to tactile, what we're looking at is a child can be a, a child who's sensory seeking with tactile and really has a lot of, of need to touch and a child who's sensory defensive and doesn't want to touch. And what I will tell you is if a child has a sense of danger with regards to touch, that will always win. Absolutely. So it's that fight or flight. And we, with a child that has vision loss really, really needs their sense of touch. They need their sense of touch to be able to use, to, to explore the world. And so we really need to, to focus on that and really help those kids get through that. So uh, we really want to concentrate on that for being able to reach and reach out and touch and handle tools in the classroom to be able to use a fork, to be able to use a stylus, to be able to touch a braille writer, to be able to to read Braille, all of those things are really important at, for their sense of touch. But if they're not willing to reach out and touch, if their reaction to tactile is danger, then it's it's a red flag and we really, really need to, to assist that child in uh, opening up that piece of their world and helping them to, to engage more mm -hmm. in, that, in that part of their world. The second part is vestibular and movement. That helps us with our sense of balance. That helps us with, you know, knowing where things um, are in the world. We are constantly moving. As infants, when you start moving, that's, you know, you're looking towards something and that's what you're doing. You are moving toward that in our world. With, as toddlers, you are on the playground and you're, you know, you're swinging, you're going down the slide. 
those kiddos with a, a vision impairment, they are seeking out that same movement. They really want that movement. But if they're not seeing those opportunities, a lot of times they're losing out on them. So they sometimes will then substitute those opportunities by doing some what Rocking, we shaking yeah. those classes so are, are deemed self stimulatory doing that kind of thing i don't i don't think it's a bad thing because they're seeking out those typical kinds of movement opportunities that we see all kids wanting to have so what we need to do as parents as providers as teachers is make sure that those kids get those opportunities all the time. You know, that that they're giving those opportunities in, I hate to say acceptable, but in more socially- Socially adaptive. Adapted ways. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Use our formal yeah. teaching words, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, and then the last one is um, proprioception, and that is um, our, our joint sense, heavy, heavy work activities, um, those sorts of things are push pull activities are part of our our world. You know, you'll see kids that push are pushing trucks. You'll see um, pulling pulling heavy like um, actually climbing activities. All those That's things pulling, are yeah. yes, the, all those things are proprioception. And what that does is helps helps us to know like where to reach for, how far to reach to grab a cup. Again, if we're not seeing that, you know, if we're not seeing this cup here, we do not know how far to reach and how 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 much we need to do that. We give tactile cues to our kids, you know, to do that, but but still it's really hard. So what we do is we do lots of those push pull activities to kind of give them a better sense of how their joints and their muscles work, and that's really helpful in teaching that sense of proprioception. So, I feel like we would be remiss in any conversation about tactile defensiveness if we did not talk about hand over hand a little bit. Oh, thank you. What a wonderful segue. So with fine motor skills, one of the things that has traditionally, hopefully way in the past happened, is that when we were teaching, and this wasn't just kids with vision impairment, but when we were teaching kids how to do things, we would take their hand and we would say, here, let me show you how to do this. And we would, you know, take their hand and have them engage in an activity, uh, a sensory activity or a fine motor activity. And this is how they would learn, we thought they would learn, to do a fine motor skill. Here, let me show you how to button, okay? And we would show them how to button. Let me show you how to pick up a fork. Let me show you how to answer the phone. Not really. I mean, <laughs> that's sure. just what I have here. Okay, so um, what we have learned over the years that that is a, a really poor way to teach our, our kids how to do that, because what they learn is that this tactile cue is part of what they need to, to know to do that task. Instead, you guys have probably heard this before if you're if you're listening to this series, but it's just vitally important for us to teach our kids to do things hand under hand. This is the adult hand. This is the child's hand. We want the hand of the child on top of ours, and we want them to kind of go with us to learn the task. So I am doing the buttoning. I am doing, I am grabbing the fork for the first time. This is supposed to be the same hand. So if this is the right hand of the child, this is my right hand. Hard and to I, demonstrate having two right hands. I know it's hard to demonstrate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I am I am guiding the child, and then I can gradually fade so the child is actually doing the work, you know, with me. But it's really important. And and I and I was telling Alex this earlier because I've been doing this long enough that I remember doing it the wrong way for 40 years, years I believe you said, yeah. <laughs> yes, for Long a while. Time. And um, that I've had kids of, of that are now adults that would start to do the task and then they would wait because they needed that cue for me to hold on the top. They thought that was part of the process of learning. So if nothing else, we really need to be aware that we need to give them the cue that, and it's much, easily, more, much more easily faded. 
Um, See, I didn't even know about these OT aspects about the importance of hand under hand. I, I, I knew the TVI parts. I knew it was important for autonomy. I knew it was important for safety. There are even more reasons that hand under hand is absolutely critical. Absolutely. From, it's from the tactile part, from the sensory part. It's that the child has more control. It's also that um, the ch t child is an active participant in the learning process, and it's much more um, or much less intrusive, I should say, in, in doing that. So and then, oh, go ahead. Did you have? Well, I think we've just about covered sensory. I, we were kind of running short on time. Do you have any good fine motor tips just to kind of end us off on? So just the quick fine motor tips that I wanted to say with kids of all developmental levels is that you want to start proximal and work distal. You want to start close to the body and you want to work toward the hands. So a child that has multiple uh, involvement, you know, and you're working just on reaching kinds of tasks, you want to make sure they're in a stable sitting position, you know, so that you can work on those reaching, reaching skills. If you're working on a child with brailing, you know, you want to make sure that they have, you know, if they need to have stability of their hands on uh, the support surface on the table, you know, if that's what they need. If they need to have their wrists supported with a wrist guard, do that. If they need to have extra, you know, extra support, whatever support they need more proximally, make sure that they have that so they can work distally at whatever point that is. That is the one thing that I want to make sure that you're doing because that's not only a sensory, but that's a motor thing that the kids are learning. And um, there's lots of specific things that we could teach for specific skill development on uh, dressing, on eating, on using a pencil, on using the braille writer, on all those kinds of things from an OT perspective. But what's more important to, is to kind of grasp those big concepts right now. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you so much for being on this episode of Teaching Tips Tuesday with us, Mimi. I have one more question for you, and that is, what is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of the job is actually getting that feedback from the kids. I really ha I had a recent um, recent opportunity to get that from a child who was so proud of herself. When I wasn't there of accomplishing something that we'd worked on all year, she asked the teacher to send me a picture of her accomplishing it and she said do you think miss mimi is going to be proud of me i'm so proud of myself That's so and sweet. that is the biggest treat that you can mm -hmm. get as a therapist as a teacher as a parent anything absolutely all right well thank you again so much for being on with us today mimi and thank you at home for watching another episode of teaching tips tuesday as always if you have any questions comments or topics we want discussed please leave them in the comments i will try and find an expert that we can get talking to and i hope you have a great week thanks alex <laughs>